Hey there, and welcome to Waltrip Unfiltered. I'm your host, Waltrip. If you hadn't told your friends about our podcast yet, be sure to do so and ask them to follow along using their favorite podcast app. I'm headed out west, traveling to Vegas. We're going to preview the big triple header from the desert this weekend, and I look forward to it straight ahead. There's been a lot of talk this week about Kyle Busch and him running in the truck series race at Atlanta, a race that he totally dominated. And people seem to have a problem with that. Well, guess what? That's been going on since the beginning of time. Should the Cup Stars race in the lesser series? I say, heck yeah. If you want to be the best, you got to beat the best. And when those young truckers get in their machines and they go out and win a race, if Kyle Busch isn't in it, do they just wonder a little bit? I think I could have beat Kyle that day. <laughs> I remember when I was a kid coming up, I couldn't wait to get my chance to run in the, in the Bush series back then or the trucks back then. I was a cup driver, and I didn't get to race those races as a kid. My first opportunity was in cup. And so when I would go down and run those races, and I would look over and I'm racing against Daryl Waltrip and, and Dale Earnhardt and Mark Martin, and I go to victory lane, you know, it gave me confidence. I'm like, I beat those guys. I can beat them on Sunday, too. Sure, it take me a long time to get to victory lane on Sunday, but the wins on Saturday gave me the confidence that with the right equipment, I could beat the best. So the fact that Kyle is out there on the track racing those kids, I think they should be thankful for that. And as fans, you know, just enjoy the show. He went to the back of the truck race in Atlanta and drove through the field all the way to win that race. It was really, really entertaining watching how Kyle drives that truck. And think about this too. Kyle Busch gives a lot of young drivers opportunities to run the truck series. William Byron, Eric Jones, those two guys. Christopher Bell, he started there as well. So many young racers, Bubba Wallace, have gotten opportunities in NASCAR through Kyle's truck team. And you know, if you're the owner of the truck team, and the reason why I think Kyle likes running the racing so much, obviously, he, he wants to beat everyone every day. That's just who he is, which is awesome. That's why he's a great racer. But he also needs to quality control his equipment. You know, he's building new trucks and new designs and different aero um, tendencies that the trucks will have. He wants to make sure he gets out there on that racetrack and feels what his kids have. It's a great way for him to analyze the talents of a young racer, knowing what he can do behind the wheel. So give Kyle a break. You know, if you didn't like them racing in, in the truck series at Atlanta, i got some bad news for you. He's doing the triple in Vegas. He's going to run the trucks, the Xfinity, and the cup race. It's his hometown. I think he's coming here to show off. We'll have to see how that works out. What about our buddy Kyle Larson? He sure ruffled some feathers this week, didn't he? Talking about the Hendrick Motorsports team's. I guess he used the word cheating. Well, I don't guess. I saw it. But that's not what he meant. Racers know what he meant. You push the rules. But you got to figure out where the line is that that goes over the line. And I think Kyle was just saying that as they understand more about how the rules are being policed, they'll push harder. He said cheating. But if you're a racer, he didn't really mean cheating. I think racers knew what Kyle meant. Racers meant racers think that everybody's just going to push and and you just don't want to push too much at first till you figure out how what areas you can and can't push in <laughs> he was quickly told to i would assume uh make an apology for that statement and say that he did not mean cheating which like i said i'm a race car guy i knew what he meant i didn't have a problem with it but Somebody must have because he, he had to issue that apology. So I'm just thankful for Kyle. I'm just thankful that, that we have people like him out here racing in the dirt in Vegas and, and all the things that he does. He can even squeeze around a golf in with me and Denny and the other golf guys, tour guys. Not very often, though, because most of the time he's in that sprint car somewhere chunking up some mud. Now, when I golf, I chunk up mud, which is not good. They make fun of me. They say I'm the greenskeeper's worst nightmare because I hit it fat. Fat and ugly. Darn it. I'm going to get better, though. It isn't from a lack of trying. 
I just need to get a lesson, I think. You know, I wrote on my Twitter a week ago before we headed to Atlanta that if you forgot the word tapered spacer or you forgot the words arrow package and just enjoy the race, I think you'd have a pretty good time. I know I was right about the statement that nobody can tell what tapered spacer is and the spoiler on the back and the splitter underneath of it, that, 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 that just don't matter. It's about the drivers. It's about the, 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 the competition, how intense it is. And at Atlanta, let me just throw a few factoids out there at you. It was the closest finish on a mile and a half in 28 mile and a half races, just over two tenths of a second. There were more leaders, more lead changes, and more cars on the lead lap than any of the previous five Atlanta races. The product was good, the racing was fun, and I liked it. And I can promise you this, the racing at Vegas will even be better because there's a lot of grip in the Vegas track. That means these drivers can really lay their leg in it and hold it down probably throughout a whole fuel run. At Atlanta, the grip goes away and you have to lift off the throttle in the turns at some point. That causes separation. Some guys' cars handle a little bit better. But at Las Vegas, the fact that the grip's going to be in the tires, that means closer racing. It's going to be fun to watch. It's going to remind me of what I saw at the All-Star Race, I believe. That's what I think we're going to see in Vegas, which was two, three wide racing on a mile and a half. <laughs> Something we'd never seen before. It's going to be fun to watch. Everybody loves the West Coast swing. We come to Vegas and Phoenix and Cali, and most of the drivers spend a lot of the time out here. They don't go back for it. One driver who loves coming out west for this swing is my buddy Denny Hamlin. Hamlin off turn Watch number out. four. No, side by side battle to the finish this time. Denny Hamlin wins his second Daytona 500 and wins it for Coach Gibbs in Toyota. In the 11 car. Yeah. I'm honored to have two time Daytona 500 champion, winner of the 2019 Daytona 500 kickoff this season, Denny Hamlin. Denny, welcome to my podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. I was making sure they weren't going to cancel you after week one, so I, I decided to come <laughs> week two. Well, your buddy Austin told me that he wanted to make sure this was really a podcast, and I wasn't going to tell Denny, there was some news. Joe Gibbs Racing Stables today that Kyle Busch has signed up with Gibbs, with M&M's back. That's awesome news. I know your your relationship with FedEx and how long y'all been together, that's so unique and you've got to be so thankful when when you see that black 11 car with fedex on the side of it kind of take you back to when you first you know when you first showed up that was your car and it still is today yeah and i mean that's you know it's so rare in our sport to to have a, a full-time sponsor and much less one that you know has been as loyal as they have to to me uh for my entire career and um you know it's it's definitely a, a partnership that in a and a friendship that I've had with that company for a very long time and all the executives there. Uh, I chat with them regularly and, you know, we talk a, a lot of racing and, and things that are not racing as well. So, you know, th you know, they are, they are all in our sport and they really believe in it and the value that it brings. And, um, I mean, this is a, this is one of the America's biggest companies that, uh, that believe in the racing platform and they don't just, you know, sponsor our car. They have, uh, I know they have the FedEx preview show uh, on on NASCAR's website, and they do they do a lot of commercials and things like that uh, surrounding NASCAR. So, you know, they they really believe in the program, and the reason they started way back in the day was, you know, if Fred Smith told me he says, you know, our employees wanted it. You know, it's something that they wanted to be a part of, and you know, this is about the employees. And so, I get to go to a lot of different hubs with those guys and uh, meet meet some employees, and, and I like seeing them there with their FedEx racing gear on and their hat. It's an old worn hat. It's one that they, they wear to work every day. And you can tell, you know, those hats is, that people wear every day. And so it's awesome that I get the support from them. And I'm always getting messages all over social media about, you know, picture, people sending me pictures of a FedEx truck going down the highway. And they're like, hey, there's Denny, you know. And so people, you know, when they draw that connection, uh, you know, that's that's what that program's all about, right, is, is creating that connection with, with, with me and, and with that brand. And, you know, it's, it's been awesome representing them. Yeah. Every time I see a FedEx truck, I do think of Denny. So obviously their <laughs> branding is, is working out well. I know the week after the 500 was crazy for you. Are you back into a normal routine or 
and tell me some of the stories of, of post Daytona 500 win life for you. Yeah, I mean, you, you like to be able to kind of enjoy it, but you really got, you know, kind of a week of a bunch of stuff that you got to do. And, you know, you're telling yourself the whole time that, like, you know, after this week, it'll all be worth it. Uh, but, you yeah, know, certainly a tough week as far as scheduling is concerned. Um, you know, I was really, I was in downtown Atlanta really, uh, you know, an hour and a half before practice uh, on Friday, you know, doing a bunch of stuff still. So, it was a busy week, but this week kind of got back to normal, which is which is good because it kind of gives me a little bit more time to kind of prepare for, uh, you know, Las Vegas coming up. Well, when you say normal week, I know for you that usually includes basketball and possibly golf. So any relaxation? Did you get to do any of that this week? Uh, barely any. Charlotte's, you know, been like Seattle here lately where it's just nothing but a bunch of rain. So, it uh, it hasn't been very good for golf conditions, but uh, really just kind of been hanging out with the family and stuff at, at home, uh, running a bunch of errands that kind of have gotten stacked up behind over the last few weeks. And, you know, when you start traveling and, and go to Daytona for 10 days or so, it's, uh, you know, things start adding up. But, you know, yeah, this week's definitely been a whole lot better. And, you know, kind of now, I'm, you know, I feel like I'm more prepared to go into this weekend than I was at Atlanta. Where in the world are you today, by the way? We're chatting via phone here on our podcast. I am in a spare bedroom upstairs in my house because, you know, Jordan, we have our kids downstairs, and then her sister uh, has a couple kids, and they're downstairs, and they're just making a bunch of racket and stuff. So I found me a nice, quiet place upstairs, and I may stay up here a while. Is that my room, I'm the guest room I stay in? <laughs> it may or may not be. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit um, about Daytona, the win, and how special it was, especially considering what all J.D. Gibbs did for you. We were blessed to have Matt Benedetto on last week, and J.D. was instrumental in, in getting him started in NASCAR as well, and he, he just had so much thanks in his heart for, for the per- performance he had, being able to run up front with you guys, but you took home the trophy, and and talk to me about how that felt for J- J.D. Yeah, it certainly was significant for the whole Gibbs family. And, you know, I saw uh, Melissa, you know, J.D.'s wife and his kids and all there at the racetrack. Uh, and they traveled to quite a few races as well, um, you know, even before. But they were all down there in Daytona. So there's obviously I saw them before the race. And there's a little extra motivation there. You know, they're all, you know, you know taking pictures. And you got, you know, the whole J.D., signature there above the door and um so it's just a little extra motivation and when you you know, were, were able to go out there and, and win and you know the kind of the first race after you know he had passed you know it's significant because a you got their family there uh but b for joe you know i know he's you know kind of had a really tough month um even though you know i, I felt like everyone thought you know this this day was going to be inevitable um, when we were going to lose JD, but you know, you, you hate to think that it's really going to happen, and it's just been a really tough, you know, time for them and for me. And and like you talked about with Matt, it's like you know, he's JD has affected so many people inside the garage. Um, you know, I know a lot of the JG, JGR employees, uh, probably most of them in there, JD has hired uh, at, at some point. So. It's just uh, he's the one that kind of, you know, really helped build and grow this um, organization. Uh, when Joe was away at the Redskins for his second stint, um, J.D. was the guy that I kind of talked to. He was the one who, I mean, he was the boss. He was the man that, you know, anytime, you know, any issues came up or uh, anything performance, he was the guy that he was the number one guy that I talked to to kind of get things handled. So, um, you know, his, his kind of legacy obviously still lives in through JGR and, and, and the things that he put in place there for that team to be successful. Um, and, and there's so many other drivers that uh, ha- are in the Cup Series today or team members because of JD. Yeah, and I, I know it, it was heartwarming for Joe to see how much everybody cared and, and wanted to honor, honor JD. And that that finish one two three, <laughs> and then Matt Demetta leading leading the most laps. It was just a, it was an awesome performance for you guys at, at like you said the perfect time. 
Yeah, no doubt. And, and, you know, it was great seeing Matt up there and, you know, he's running with my old crew chief and wheels. And uh, I got to talk to him a little bit at Atlanta. And um, he, he was like, you know, I, he says, I, I kind of, yeah, I'm out here or kind of on an Island where, you know, we don't have a whole lot of setup sharing and things like that uh, with that team right now. And so he says, look, I, I knew what it always worked for you and we put it in there and it was fast and, and he liked it. So, <laughs> Um, it was, uh, it, it definitely looked like, uh, the cars of old that I used to drive. So it was, a uh, he was a really a force, uh, to be reckoned with. And, and he's, you know, you know, he, he's got to drive, he's been in the Toyota family, uh, for, for quite a long time, um, before his stint, um, with that 32 car. And so, you know, kind of see him back with the Toyota family and, you know, such an underrated driver itself. Yeah, that's awesome. And I, one last thing about the Daytona 500. I was watching closely doing some live streaming, and on that last restart, you know, as a fan, which is what I was, I couldn't hear any, any radio transactions or what, what was going on. I'm thinking to myself, and I said on the stream, yeah, he's got to start in front of Logano. He's got the fastest car. And, and then you didn't. And I just, mm-hmm. you know, I just, I wondered what your thinking was and what, how confident you were being the leader, having that sprint to the check. Well, I knew that by taking the outside, I was actually pinning Logano um, behind the 18. Uh, with, with having Logano, if I chose to take the bottom and put Logano behind me, he was immediately going to be able to go on offense uh, on me, where he was kind of in a box on the bottom line if I chose the top. So, you know, I think that Kyle actually was, you know, when people kind of second guess, you know, why did he let me in? I think, you know, looking back on it, you know, I know that, you know, what line that I, I would choose personally, but it allowed him to go on offense. If, I, if I'm just running on his right side door and I'm side drafting him, he's helping, you know, he can't do anything. There's nothing he can do. He could just hope that Logano is going to push him past me. And, and what, what really is the odds of that happening? it probably won't happen. I, Joey's going to try to make a move for himself. So I think that he thought his best option was, look, know that I'm going to be ter- uh, second place off of turn two. I'll be clear of whoever's on the outside, and hopefully I can make a run on him. And really he did. We just we were able to block the immediate move that he had, and it, it just kind of allowed me to kind of control the race from that point. Well, it was an awesome display of teamwork. That's what I, I kind of want to transition to to Atlanta and the racing we saw there. Um, statistically speaking, it was the closest margin of victory on a mile and a half in 28 races. And a number of lead changes, leaders, cars on the lead lap, all those were up over the last five Atlanta races. That's statistically speaking. As a fan, I watched closely. I went up in the grandstands, and I wanted to see who ran where and what all was going on. I, I I enjoyed the race as a fan, as a driver. What what for you? I know you didn't run as well as you hoped, but uh, what did you see? What did you feel behind the wheel? Well, I, I mean, I think when you kind of look at you know how well how how we did, we we actually got caught twice under you know pitting, and then the caution came out, and so we had to wave around twice, and then kind of was able to battle back there to to get eleventh uh, or so, but we were. You know, top five, uh, I think, in the second stage. We ran really well, competitive. Um, it was really a learning experience for me and Chris to kind of, you know, you know, I could tell, like, 100 laps in, oh, man, had he known me, he would know that when I wanted a change, I really needed a bigger change than what, than what he gave me. And, and that I knew that, you know, that, that stuff is going to take a little bit of time with me and him. Um, but I, I love his work ethic and how hard he, you know, pays attention to details and stuff. So I'm really excited about what we're going to be, you know, how we're going to perform this year. Uh, but the package itself, um, it's just different. I mean, to be honest with you, it's a different type of racing. It's a different type of skill set that it takes, but it still takes skill. Um, you know, it's, it's a little bit of drafting, you know, knowledge of putting yourself in the right lane at the right time on restart. You know, making sure you don't get caught in the top or the bottom. You know, all that it takes knowledge. And it, I think it's more, honestly, a thinking man's type of race now than it is a car performance race. 
Uh, I think car performance w- will matter. Uh, ultimately, the faster cars are going to have more opportunities to make passes than others. But, I, you know, for sure, I, I think, you know, halfway into the season, when we look back probably, you know, 14, 15 ra- races from now, you're going to see more cars on the lead lap. Uh, you know, the the drop off from first to last, you know, as far as laps down probably won't be uh, as big. Um, it'll take longer two lap cars. I think that, you know, Vegas this weekend, you know, a little bit what I saw from the test, um, it was important to kind of stay in the pack of cars. Uh, I, I still think that, you know, the, the cream is going to rise to the top when it comes to these things. You're going to see in practices a lot of names that you don't normally see up top, uh, up top because they get a, you know, a good draft or something like that. But, um, in the end, you know, your best drivers, you're still going to be able to go up there and perform and, and get wins. But I do think it, you know, the, the days of, you know, you know, Matt Harvick or, or you know, sometimes Kyle has those races where they just kind of hit it and they just leave the field and they're just so much better than everyone else. I don't know that you're going to have those days anymore. I think that it's going to be a little bit more, um, there's a little bit more parity in the cars themselves where if someone takes a gamble and stays out front, you, you could see, you know, more race, different race winners than, than what you see in the past. And some people like that, some people don't. But it's, it's just a different type of racing that we're all going to get used to. You know, I told someone the other day, I'd like to hear your opinion on this. I said the driver's jobs just got harder. And I think that'll be the case at Vegas this weekend. You're going to have to, to, to fight harder, in my opinion, than you ever have. Do you think that has merit? Do you think that's true? I do, because I think that it's a, there's more thinking that is going to go into it. I think before, if your car was fast, you knew that you were going to be up front. And now I think that you have to, you have to always put yourself in the right position to a, you know, I've noticed that Atlanta, there were small packs of cars. So like you'd have the leader and maybe second and third, and then there'd be a little gap and then there'd be fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and then a little gap. And it was really hard to jump from pack to pack. The cars weren't, you know, you couldn't outhandle somebody and kind of drive through one pack and then get to the next pack. You really had to be strategic on not losing the draft to the car in front of you, uh, even at Atlanta. Um, it was a significant lap time difference. So I think that as a driver, you really got to stay on, on, on your P's and Q's and make sure you, you, you're really paying attention at all times of where you put yourself to give yourself a shot at the end of winning these things. Yeah, when I was a racer back in the day, I would be more Talladega, but, but it was a mental drain. You just you had so much to think about, and I think going to Vegas, we're going to really get to see a of this rules situation perfectly clear. We should know a lot more when we leave Vegas. Would you agree? I would agree with that definitely. Um, you know, I just you know where where do we want to be? You know what 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 do fans want to see or what does NASCAR want to see with the package? You know, if they want to see uh, more side-by-side racing, I, I think they'll probably have that um, than, than what they had in the past. As far as like more passing, once things get strung out, I'm not sure that we'll see that, but certainly I think that the, the field itself will be closer together. Um, the challenge will be, you know, Track position. That that's going to be you know and look like the hardest thing to overcome in that uh, Las Vegas test was once someone got out there in the lead, you know, could anyone really overtake them without them having to just kind of pull over and let everyone else go? Um, and that's simply because you know when you're running wide open and the car behind you is running wide open, the person in front's always going to have the advantage because <clears throat> they have the cleaner air, and ultimately the person that comes up behind is in a bigger wake because of the bigger spoilers that they're at always, they're always going to be at a larger disadvantage. So um, it, it, it's going to be a work in progress. You know, who knows if this is even the last rendition of, you know, rule changes that we go through to get to the racing that we're, we're, we're trying to get to, you know, really who knows, but uh, I, I certainly think, you know, this will be a good test for it this weekend. I, I agree. And I was going to ask you, uh, there's been a lot of talk recently about, um, 
scheduling and where we're going to race and how it's all going to work. If you were, if you were the, the schedule maker, the president of NASCAR, own NASCAR, whatever, would you start out West in January or do you like the idea of starting the season with the Daytona 500? Do you have any ideas, like anything that you would like to see considered when it comes to scheduling as we race into 2020 and 21? Yeah. I mean, I think that certainly there's some merit in um, making the, the season shorter, however that may be. I, I don't know if it's less races, you know, maybe it's the same amount of races, just more of them per week um, type of thing. Uh, obviously that, that, that comes with a, there, there's somebody that's, that's going to take a toll on and more likely it's going to be the guys working on the cars. Um, so we, we got to think about that, but certainly in my mind, it's the middle of summer that we really need to be crushing. I mean, just when, when really there's no other professional sports that are really in its stride except for major league baseball and some PGA. I mean, there that's that's you got to be eating up that time and killing the ratings in the summertime so whether it's double headers uh that we have whether it's you know midweek races um you know you, you have like a you could do maybe a wednesday uh or i'm sorry a monday uh night then you got a wednesday or, or a thursday race or thursday night and then a sunday you know three in one week you can start to really st- shorten the season up to where, you know, you're going to make it more in line with what other professional sports are because obviously our sport um, it has the longest season, um, except you could maybe argue golf, but, you know, those guys can really choose their schedule and, and how many events they choose to play in. Um, so I think there certainly needs to be some revamping there. I think, you know, the tracks and, the, and NASCAR got very, you know, they got overzealous in the, in the 90s and the 2000s when things were, so great and uh you know you sometimes got to pull back there and and start to create more excitement about going to nascar races and creating the buzz around it and so you know if you have it for 10 months 11 months of the year i mean you you never really look for never really look forward to it you know because it's always there right that's that's an interesting take on a look at it, and and certainly something that that I think NASCAR is thinking of double headers, especially we had one in Atlanta with the trucks and the Xfinity, and your uh, your buddy Jimmy Johnson was up in the Fox booth. I know you you were in the booth with us last year. What were your thoughts on the job <laughs> that Jimmy did in the booth on mm-hmm. Fox? Yeah, it's uh it, it's definitely a, a fun job. I got to do Talladega, which you know to me is is an exciting race no matter what. So it made my whole job a whole lot easier having to, you know, do it that type of race. But uh, certainly, you know, a lot of these guys are very knowledgeable and especially these recent drivers that go up there and, and, you know, do it. Uh, they do such a great job because they know what's going on in the sport right now. And they know how the cars are driving right now. And, and, and I can tell you just from, you know, the 14 years that I've been doing it from, from now till 2006, when I started, it's, it's not the same. There is nothing, I mean, it is entirely different technique that you use to drive than what the, you used to just 14 years ago. So uh, those guys having that updated knowledge is certainly valuable. And it keeps, you know, and, and not only that, but you have the fans that are watching, you know, recognize that person. It allows them to kind of see them outside the race car and outside that driver's suit uh, to get to know their personality a little bit. Well, and I think it's really cool that you guys take the time to do it as well because, I mean, your fans want to hear what you got to say and think, and and I just really enjoy the opportunity I get to have one of you racers up there in the booth with us. I'm constantly learning and trying to stay relevant and and current, and th- that certainly helps us. So, appreciate you joining me today for my podcast. And if you got any buddies, you can tell them to subscribe on their favorite podcast app, and they can get Wall Trip Unfiltered and listen to us. How's that sound? Sounds good to me. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> Yeah, it's a good time, Denny, always. We appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, guys. Well, this has been a lot of fun. We were able to talk a little bit about the Atlanta races. Talked about Kyle Busch and his doing the triple header here in Vegas this weekend. And I got to spend some time with the Daytona 500 champ, Denny Hamlin. 
but talking racing is what I love the most, and that's what we were able to do with him today. So I hope you enjoyed our podcast. Be sure to tell your friends about us here at Walter Unfiltered. Sign up using your favorite podcast app, and we're going to drop episodes weekly. I love digging into the details. I do a lot of research for this show to make sure I understand what issues are getting people's attention. And then what questions to ask these awesome drivers that agree to come on our show. So thanks so much for listening. If you haven't told your friends about Waltrip Unfiltered, please be sure to do so. You can subscribe via their favorite podcast app. And we're going to be here every week talking NASCAR. Thanks so much for joining us.